Welcome to Two Messianic Jews, where we think deeply about Messianic Jewish history and theology. If you would like to join us in conversations about the Jewishness of the New Testament, Second Temple Judaism, and the modern Messianic Jewish community, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast. We would love for you to join us. For centuries, Christian interpreters have considered Paul's theology as a severe departure from the Judaism of his day and that Paul's understanding of the gospel erases Jewish identity. For example, Christian New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says this about Paul's perception of the Torah and Jewish identity. Therefore, the things which marked out the Jewish people from the surrounding Gentiles, in other words, the works of the Jewish law, were now irrelevant and worse than irrelevant. If they were highlighted, they were separating that which God had joined together once and for all and forever. Christian theologian Dr. Kendall Solon, who argues against these perspectives, summarizes nearly 2,000 years of the church's interpretive history. He says, Traditionally, the church has understood itself as a spiritual fellowship in which the carnal distinction between Jew and Gentile no longer applies. The church has declared itself a third and final race that transcends and replaces the difference between Israel and the nations. While Dr. Sullen and many others are helping the church correct these types of interpretations, this long-held position still needs to be addressed. There are countless ways to challenge replacement theology, but to make this a bit simpler, we will focus on something very specific that challenges this idea. We will ask, what was Paul's understanding of how the Shema relates to Israel's distinct identity and Gentile inclusion into the people of God? Is his understanding of the Shema entirely different from the Jewish thought of his day? Does his understanding of the Shema transform into one that erases Jewish identity? Christopher Bruno, in his book God is One, The Function of Heis Ha Theos as a Ground for Gentile Inclusion in Paul's Letters, argues that there was virtual unanimity among Second Temple Jews that the Shema functioned as a way for Israel to distinguish themselves from the other nations of the world, and that Paul's understanding of the Shema shifted away from being focused on the distinctiveness of Israel and became only focused on the inclusion of Gentiles into the people of God after becoming a follower of Jesus. Once Paul did this, he stood apart from the Jewish understanding of the Shema in his day. Today, I would like to challenge that thesis. I will argue that like the Tanakh, Josephus, and later Jewish tradition, Paul understands the Shema as both a marker of Israel's distinctiveness and a justification for Gentile inclusion into the people of God. A brief exploration of how these different authors use the Shema shows that Paul's understanding of the Shema, as it relates to Israel and Gentile inclusion, does not stand apart from all Jewish understanding before, during, and after his life. Also, Paul's use of the Shema shows he continues to value Jewish and non-Jewish identity in Jesus-following communities. Let us start with the Shema itself, Deuteronomy 6.4. This famous verse says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is much to be said about this pivotal verse. However, for this episode, I will focus on its meaning within its historical context and how later interpreters used it concerning Israel's distinctiveness and Gentile inclusion, because I think this helps clarify how Paul uses the Shema in Romans 3, 27 through 31. Scholars of Deuteronomy commonly note that Deuteronomy 6.4 is not a metaphysical statement of belief that only one God exists. Using it as an espousal of monotheism came later. Instead, the Shema functions more like a pledge of allegiance for Israel to remain faithfully committed and obedient to the God of Israel alone. I want to point out two features of the context of Deuteronomy 6.4 that indicate Israel's pledge to remain faithful to God indicated a commitment to observe the Torah. First, Deuteronomy 6.4 is directly preceded by Deuteronomy's re-presentation of the Ten Commandments, which starts the same way as the Shema. Deuteronomy 5.1 says, Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the laws and rules that I proclaim to you this day. Study them and observe them faithfully. The Hear, O Israel of Deuteronomy 6.4 can call us back to the Hear, O Israel of the giving of the Torah and specifically the Ten Commandments. The immediate context of Deuteronomy 6.4 supports this. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2 says, and this is the instruction, the laws and the rules, that the Lord your God has commanded me to impart to you, to be observed in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you, your children, and your children's children 
may revere the Lord your God and follow as long as you live all his laws and commandments that I enjoin upon you to the end that you may long endure. And immediately following the Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 5-6, through 6, which says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. The surrounding context of Deuteronomy 6, 4 indicates the original meaning of the Shema was not simply about declaring your belief that only one God exists, but it was Israel's communal pledge to worship God alone and to remain faithful to his Torah. Orthodox Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Vishagrad agrees with this interpretation and argues this is the perspective espoused by the Talmud. He says, Throughout the Talmud, the recitation of the Shema is referred to as the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. This expression would be quite inappropriate if Deuteronomy 6.4 were read as a metaphysical statement about the nature of God. Instead, it is read as a declaration of total and unconditional loyalty to God's sovereign rule and the acceptance of what follows from that loyalty, obedience to his divine will as expressed in the Torah. And so, after considering the original context of the Shema, we can confidently understand that Deuteronomy 6.4 is an injunction for the people of Israel to remain distinct from other nations and obey the Torah to demonstrate their covenant loyalty to the one God of Israel alone. This will be important to remember as we go through other uses of the Shema in Zechariah, Josephus, Paul, and later Jewish tradition. Before moving on to these other authors, I want to note how they did not always quote Deuteronomy 6.4 in full but we can know they make reference to the Shema because of their key use of the phrase, God is one. This occurs twice in the Tanakh itself, Malachi 2.10 and Zechariah 14.9. and this episode, we will be taking a close look at Zechariah. Abbreviating the Shema by using God is one became a widespread habit in the Second Temple period, as we will see demonstrated by Josephus and Paul. In fact, the Talmud shows that later, Jewish people abbreviated the Shema even further, Barakot 61b recounts Rabbi Akiva's execution at the hands of the Romans, and it says this, When they took Rabbi Akiva to be executed, it was time for the recitation of the Shema, and they were raking his flesh with iron combs, and he was reciting the Shema, thereby accepting upon himself the yoke of heaven. He prolonged his uttering of the word, One. Rabbi Akiva abbreviated the Shema to a single key word, One. So, whenever I read the upcoming sources, pay attention to how they use the phrase God is one and variations like it, because they are most likely allusions to the Shema. And even if you don't think these are allusions to the Shema, they are at least places where the author reveals how they think the oneness of God relates to Israel and Gentiles. However, I find it highly likely that any appeal to God's oneness finds at least some influence from the Shema. Next, let's take a look at Zechariah 14.9. This text appears in the Elenu prayer that speaks of God's kingship and anticipates worldwide recognition of God and is recited in synagogues worldwide today. Zechariah 14 predicts a future age when all the nations of the world recognize and worship the God of the Shema but continue to remain distinct from Israel. Zechariah 14 begins with a description of an eschatological vision of the nations of the world fighting against Jerusalem. Next, it describes the Mount of Olives dramatically being split in two to allow the people of Israel to flee to safety as God judges those attacking Jerusalem. This leads into Zechariah 14.9, which says, And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So here is Zechariah making a clear appeal to the oneness of God and his vision of future Gentile inclusion and recognition that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world. Zechariah echoes the Shema, which is exclusively directed towards Israel in its original context in Deuteronomy, and yet Zechariah finds it as relevant to his prediction of Gentile inclusion. Continuing in chapter 14, Zechariah then describes God continuing to judge the unrepentant nations who attacked Jerusalem, but then mentions this in Zechariah 14:16. Then all who survive of the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the festival of booths, which is Sukkot. So Zechariah 14 presents this dramatic prediction 
that at the end of days, non-Jewish nations of the world will recognize that God is one and worship God alongside Israel at the temple in Jerusalem during Sukkot. This is highly significant in two regards. One, Zechariah views the Shema as relevant to the nations. And two, he views the Shema as relevant to the nations without sacrificing Israel's distinction from the nations. Notice that Gentiles remain Gentiles as they participate in a Jerusalem temple-based holiday which presupposes Israel maintains its distinctiveness from the nations and maintains a responsibility to observe the Torah even as Gentiles are welcomed into the people of God. And even though Gentiles now recognize the God of the Shema, they do not become Jews themselves, nor are they expected to observe the whole Torah like Israel. As a side note, some Hebrew roots and one law groups mistakenly use this verse to argue Gentile followers of Jesus are obligated to observe the whole Torah. This is too much of an aside to address in full here, but the Cliff Notes version is that they read way too much into this text. Still future expectations that the nations will participate in Sukkot do not imply full adoption of Torah observance by Christians today. And considering this is an eschatological vision, it may just be symbolic rather than literal. I don't have a firm position on that, but it's something to keep in mind when approaching apocalyptic texts. If you are interested in a fuller response to their argument, subscribe to the YouTube channel and podcast to be notified when we address this claim, and I will return to it briefly at the end of this episode. The point here is that Zechariah 14.9 understands the Shema as relevant to Gentile inclusion while presupposing Israel remains distinct and Torah observant. Taken together with Deuteronomy 6.4, the Tanakh uses the Shema to mark Israel's distinctiveness and to justify Gentile inclusion simultaneously. These two functions, while seemingly in tension with each other, are treated as compatible. What we see here in Zechariah is what I think we see in Josephus, Paul, and definitely later rabbinic writings, which explicitly place Deuteronomy 6.4 and Zechariah 14.9 alongside each other. The oneness of the God of Israel implies that all nations will worship God in unity alongside Israel one day. However, they will remain distinct from Israel and will not be expected to observe the Torah in the same way the Shema implies for Israel. All the following Jewish authors use the oneness of God to justify Gentile inclusion while presupposing the oneness of God still marks Israel's special relationship with God. Now let us look at where this happens in Josephus' Jewish Antiquities and against Appion. Josephus wrote Jewish Antiquities, which is a rewritten Bible in the early 90s CE. He wrote against Appion, which is a defense of Judaism against pagan objections, in the mid to late 90s CE. We often forget how contemporaneous Josephus was to Paul because Josephus wrote decades later. However, according to his autobiography, The Life of Josephus, we know he was about 19 years old when Paul wrote Romans around 56 CE. So Josephus' formative educational years and early public life in the Jewish world were during the same years Paul was advising his congregations all around the Mediterranean. They experienced the same religious and political landscape of mid-first century Rome. Not only this, but they both claim to be Pharisees and are both writing to Gentiles. I point out these similarities to make the case that Josephus' use of the Shema in relation to Gentile inclusion is worth holding in view when we examine Paul. I think his use of the Shema is a second temple example of a Jewish author using God as one for both marking Israel's distinctiveness and justifying Gentile inclusion, thus indicating Paul is not alone in his understanding of the Shema during this period, which is following the earlier biblical example of Zechariah. In addition to showing the similarity, exploring Josephus also illuminates a critical difference between him and Paul. Josephus is open to Gentile conversion and full adoption of Torah observance, whereas Paul strongly opposes this option for the Gentiles and the Jesus-following communities. Both Paul and Josephus understand the Shema as having the twofold function of marking Israel's distinctiveness and justifying Gentile inclusion. But Paul is more adamant about maintaining the distinctions between Jew and Gentile when it comes to identity and Torah observance. Paul wants to emphasize faith in Jesus as the Messiah as the point of unity between Jew and Gentile. Starting with Against Appion, in the introduction of a section where Josephus summarizes portions of the law, he says, We have but one temple for the one God, 
for like ever loveth like. Common to all, as God is common to all. Josephus envisions Jews and Gentiles worshiping the one God at the Jerusalem temple together. About this passage, John Barclay notes, the particular temple and deity are also universal. This is a development from Jewish Antiquities 4.201, where Josephus rewrites Deuteronomy 4 through 12. Josephus says, In no other city let there be either altar or temple, for God is one and the Hebrew race is one. For Josephus, like Zechariah, worshiping the one God at the one temple can be both a reflection of God's covenantal relationship with Israel and a reflection of how God is the one God over all humankind shown in against Appion. Just like in the biblical tradition, God is one has flexibility for Josephus. The covenantal meaning of God is one for Israel is presumed to be compatible with the universal implications God is one has for Gentiles. Josephus uses God as one as a marker of Israel's distinctiveness and justification for Gentile inclusion simultaneously. This shared feature between Zechariah and Josephus is what I will argue Paul follows. But before I get to Paul, I'd like to do a quick aside on Josephus' view of Gentile conversion. And when I say Gentile conversion, I am not speaking about Gentile conversion to the religion of Judaism. I'm speaking about Gentile conversion to becoming a Jew who, by definition, is expected to observe the whole Torah. During the Second Temple period, such a change of identity was marked by circumcision. Josephus himself recounts a story of Hyrcanus, the Jewish priest and Hasmonean leader in the 2nd century BCE, who captured the Idumeans and demanded their conversion. Josephus writes that Hyrcanus permitted the Idumeans to remain in their country so long as they had themselves circumcised and were willing to observe the laws of the Jews. And so, out of attachment to the land of their fathers, they submitted to circumcision and to making their manner of life conform in all other respects to that of the Jews. And from that time on, they have continued to be Jews. Shea J.D. Cohen says, Of all the practices and customs of the Jews, Josephus singles out circumcision. For him, to adopt the customs of the Jews and to be circumcised are synonymous expressions. This is what we see in Paul as well. In Galatians 5.3, Paul says, Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. About this, Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. David Rudolph says, The apostle seems to uphold the Second Temple Jewish understanding that ritual circumcision initiates one into the covenant. Covenant responsibilities detailed in the law are binding on the circumcised one. Circumcision was not merely a single mitzvah to observe. It signifies being a Jew and is the entrance into Israel's covenant with God, which entails observance of the whole Torah. Both Josephus and Paul understood circumcision as the sign that one is a Jew and is Torah observant. However, Josephus portrays Gentile conversion in a neutral to positive light and only discourages it when Jews are trying to force Gentiles to convert, whereas Paul argues strongly against Gentile conversion, such as Galatians 5.2. He says, Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. And we know Paul is talking to Gentiles here because these people are not already circumcised. About this, Jewish scholar Dr. Pamela Eisenbaum says, Paul's comments on circumcision in Galatians were originally directed to Gentiles only. Paul objects to Gentiles having to be circumcised. He does not condemn circumcision per se. In other words, Paul's message to the Galatians advocates the inclusion of Gentiles as Gentiles into the community of the people of God. He does not think Gentiles should first have to become like Jews by being circumcised in order to become members of God's people. Not only does Paul want Gentiles to remain Gentiles, but he also wants Jews to remain Jews. In 1 Corinthians 7, 17-18, Paul says, However that may be, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned, to which God called you. This is my rule in all the congregations. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? 
let him not seek circumcision. Even though Josephus and Paul both ultimately wanted to communicate unity between Jew and Gentile and understand the oneness of God as a grounding for both Israel's distinctiveness and Gentile inclusion, Paul appears more concerned with maintaining the distinction between Jews and Gentiles when it comes to identity and Torah observance than Josephus. As we will see, this has much to do with Paul's understanding of the gospel and how unity among all people can be found not in everyone becoming Jews and Torah observant, but in Jews and Gentiles having a shared faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. Now we have made our way, finally, to Paul. In Romans 3, 27-31, Paul says, Where then is boasting? It has been excluded. Through what kind of law? Of works? No, but through the law of faith. For we consider a person to be justified apart from the works of law. Or is God the God of Jews only, and not also of the nations? Yes, God is also God of the nations, since God is one, who will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through that same faith. Then do we abolish the law through faith? Certainly not. Instead, we uphold the law. Now whether you take works of law as a reference to any good deed, or works of Torah in general, or as an idiom indicating proselyte conversion rituals, I think we can say the point of verses 27 through 28 is that justification is by faith alone. There is no boasting to be found in doing good deeds, in following the Torah, or in becoming a Jew, or in being a Jew. A right relationship with God is based on committing one's loyalty to the God of Israel through faith in the Messiah. This brings us to the key verses, verses 29 through 30a which says, Or is God the God of Jews only, and not also of the nations? Yes, God is also God of the nations, since God is one. There are a few things to point out here. First, notice the progression of these rhetorical questions in connection with the conclusion. Paul's first rhetorical question, Is God the God of Jews only? Even though the answer to this rhetorical question is no, it does show that for Paul, God being one does at least mean he is the God of the Jews. This shows that for Paul, the Shema still indicated Israel as distinct from the nations and in a special relationship with God. This is shown in other verses like Romans 9 through through 5, which says, For I would pray that I myself were cursed, banished from Messiah for the sake of my people, my own flesh and blood, who are Israelites. To them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the Torah, and the temple service and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Then, after this first rhetorical question, revealing the one God is still the God of Israel, Paul does what places him in line with Zechariah, Josephus, and as we will see, later Jewish thinkers. His second rhetorical question asks if God is also the God of the nations, to which he answers, Yes, God is also God of the nations. His reason for this is the Shema, since God is one. For Paul, God is one indicates Israel is set apart from the nations and in unity with the nations simultaneously. Where can this unity be found? In the rest of verse 30, Paul says, God will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through that same faith. This is crucial when it comes to reading Paul. The unity between Jew and Gentile can be found in a shared commitment to the God of Israel, specifically expressed by faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And remember what we spoke about earlier. During the Second Temple period, being a Jew, being circumcised, meant being Torah observant. And here Paul refers to Jews as the circumcision, which implies they remained wholly committed to the Torah. And Paul continues to refer to Gentiles as the uncircumcision, which implies they remain Gentiles and are not responsible for observing the whole law, as mentioned in Galatians 5.3. This illuminates why it is so crucial for Paul to highlight that profound unity between Jew and Gentile is not found in everyone becoming Jews or in Torah observance, but in a shared faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. Paul's emphasis that it is faith that unites can raise yet another rhetorical question in verse 31. He asks, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? To which he answers, Certainly not. Instead, we uphold the law. 
Now, I want to do a lot more study on this verse, but I will share my current understanding with you, and you can tell me what you think of it. And really, that goes for all that I've shared in this episode. I try to do my due diligence, and I do my best to share my understanding with clarity, but please feel free to challenge my ideas. I am certainly all ears. I think part of what Paul means by asking and answering this rhetorical question about upholding the law is this. Unity between Jew and Gentile being found in faith does not negate the distinction between Israel and the nations. The Torah was given to Israel alone and set them apart from the nations, and this distinction continues even within the community of Jesus' followers. Therefore, by no means do we nullify the Torah. On the contrary, we uphold it. Now, if you happen to be a Christian listening in, all this talk about the distinction between Jew and Gentile and Torah observance may be making you a bit nervous. But don't worry, after I go over how later Jewish thinkers understood the Shema in relation to Israel and the Gentiles, I will return to why distinctions between Jews and Gentiles within the body of Messiah make sense within Paul's understanding of a certain aspect of the gospel message. For now, just understand that Romans 3, 29-30 shows us that Paul, like the Tanakh and Josephus, understood the Shema as a marker of Israel's distinctiveness and Gentile inclusion into the people of God. Jewish scholar Dr. Mark Nanos, in his article, Paul and the Jewish Tradition, the Ideology of the Shema, compares how Romans 3, 29-30 and later Jewish tradition use the Shema and the importance of Jewish and Gentile identity in Paul's congregations even further than I will discuss here. I'll put the citation in the description so you know where to find it. I consider it a must-read. Nano brings our attention to two texts in Jewish tradition that show an understanding that the Shema is simultaneously relevant to Israel's unique relationship with God and to Gentile inclusion. That is the Midrashic legal commentary, Sifre, on Deuteronomy 6.4, Pisca 31, and then Rashi's commentary on Deuteronomy 6.4. First, a note for the podcast listeners out there, seeing the punctuation of the Sifre on Deuteronomy 6.4 really helps clarify what this commentary is doing. So when you get the chance, I recommend watching the YouTube video where we show the text, but I will do my best to describe what is going on as I read it. The Sifre on Deuteronomy 6.4 begins by quoting the middle third of the Shema, the Lord our God, and then it comments, over us, the children of Israel. Then it quotes the last third of the Shema, the Lord is one, and comments, over all the creatures of the world. So here, the commentator splices up the Shema and assigns specific portions of it to Israel and then the whole world. The Lord our God is a reference to God's sovereignty over the children of Israel. Then, the Lord is one is a reference to God's sovereignty over the whole world. Next, it quotes the middle third of the Shema again, the Lord our God, and comments, in this world, and then quotes the last third of the Shema again, the Lord is one and comments, in the world to come. So here, the commentator is showing they understand that in their present reality, only the middle third of the Shema is manifest. Currently, in this world, God is only the God of the Jews. However, the last third of the Shema, the Lord is one, will manifest in the world to come, in a future age. Their evidence for this interpretation? They go on to cite Zechariah 14.9. As it is said, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord be one, and his name one. For the Sifre on Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema simultaneously marks Israel's special relationship with God and predicts Gentile inclusion by appealing to Zechariah 14.9. Moreover, we see the exact same line of reasoning by Rashi writing in the 10th century CE. Commenting on Deuteronomy 6.4, Rashi says, The Lord, who is our God now, but not yet the God of the other nations, is destined to be the one Lord. As it is said, For then will I give to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Zephaniah 3.9 And likewise it is said, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day shall the Lord be one, and his name one. Zechariah 14.9 Just like the Sifre before him, Rashi understands the Shema is relevant to both Israel and the nations. However, during his present age, God has not yet become the one God over the whole world. God is still only the God of Israel. 
this note on the timing is incredibly crucial. Paul and the Jewish tradition agree on the Shema's relevance to Jews and Gentiles, as shown by Deuteronomy 6.4 and Zechariah 14.9. However, Paul considers this predicted age of Gentiles recognizing the one God as already in motion upon the Messiah's resurrection. About this relationship between Paul and Jewish tradition, Mark Nano says, Paul's argument is based upon the same logic but to a different conclusion because of his understanding that Jesus Christ has brought the dawning of that awaited day. Paul's logic and conclusion are found in Romans 3.29-30 and then later in Romans 15.5-12, where he quotes the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, what he considers predictions of this new reality in which he finds himself. Romans 15.5-12 says, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Messiah Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Messiah. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Messiah has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Messiah has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, and him the Gentiles shall hope. About this passage, and Romans 3.29-30, Mark Nano says, Paul's logic is this. If all who worship the one God are Israelites or become Israelites, then God is only the God of one nation, not of all the nations. But if the non-Jews who turn to Israel's God do so while remaining non-Jews, not as members of the nation of Israel, then they worship the God of Israel as the one God of all the nations also. That is the point of Paul's argument. No matter how many difficulties this poses for these members from the other nations and the Jews who affiliate with them as co-members of this Jewish coalition, God's oneness must not be compromised by the proselyte conversion of non-Jews who turn to God by way of Jesus Christ. For Paul, that they remain members from the other nations, joining alongside of Israelites, constitutes an important proof of the propositional claims of the gospel. It signals the arrival of the awaited day when all the nations will worship the Creator God together. As Nanos mentions, these Gentiles were joining a Jewish coalition. They were not forbidden from participating in the synagogue and adopting Jewish ways of life. This was especially the case back then, considering the only other religious option was going to pagan temples and doing pagan activities. They were participating in the Jewish life of the Jesus-following community. What they were not permitted to do was changed their identity from being a Gentile to being a Jew, and thus obligated to observe the whole Torah. I think it's worth noting that Paul does not quote Zechariah 14.9 in his list of prophecies describing this new age of Gentile inclusion, nor is there any indication I have been able to find that Gentile Jesus followers were flocking to the temple for Sukkot each year. I think this is an example of Paul's already but not yet theology. The age of Gentile inclusion has begun, but we are not yet at the precise point that Zechariah describes. Essentially for Paul, Jews remaining Jews and Gentiles remaining Gentiles as they turn to the God of Israel by way of faith in Jesus the Messiah is evidence that the coming age of Gentile inclusion has in fact arrived. The age was inaugurated by the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. Elaborating on this, Dr. Kendall Solon says, The Church of Jesus Christ is a sphere of mutual blessing between Jew and Gentile, but recreated in a promissory way, as the eschatological sign and foretaste of messianic peace and mutual blessing among all the peoples of the world. Paul's understanding of the Shema is in broad agreement with the Tanakh, Josephus, and later Jewish tradition. They all understood God is one, marked Israel's distinctiveness, and justified Gentile inclusion at the same time. The key difference between Paul and Josephus is that Josephus thought the unity between Jew and Gentile is found in Torah observance, 
Whereas for Paul, the unity is found by faith in Messiah. The key difference between Paul and later Jewish tradition is the timing. Paul understood the age of Gentile inclusion as beginning with the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. These later Jewish thinkers rejected that notion and still awaited the world to come, during which Gentiles will recognize God is one. However, they all understood that whenever the day of Gentile inclusion arrives, Israel remains Israel. To cap off this episode, I would like to quote Mark 12, 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And that is it for today. If you learned something new, consider liking this video and subscribing to the YouTube channel and podcast. If you would like, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts because this really helps people discover our content. And as always, if you want to share your thoughts on anything I've presented, leave a comment or send us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's T-W-O, messianicjews at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.